Welcome to the recovery.com podcast. I'm Dr. Mala, editor-in-chief at recovery.com, and today I'm joined by my fellow hosts, Cliff McDonald, chief growth officer at recovery.com. Hi, Cliff. Hi, Dr. Mala. And Great to be here. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. And also Amanda Uphoff, chief of staff at recovery.com. Hi, Amanda. Hi, everyone. Really looking forward to this conversation, Marvin. Mr. Ventrell, Marvin, it is truly an honor. Welcome. Well, for sure, Marvin or Marv, either one is fine. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I know there's so much that has been part of your journey, and I would love to hear about how your journey into this realm and arena started. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. This field is populated largely. Professionals who work in this field are largely folks who have their own personal recovery story. And that's interesting, right? It, there are certain professions, the helping professions that tend to have people working in them and their professional capacities who also have a personal story related to it. That's not necessarily true of all professions, right? Like heart surgeons don't uh, probably don't mostly all have heart disease. And so one of the things that that has historically this business is grounded in is people with lived experience, right? We talk about that and how valuable it is all the time. At the same time, our work has very much been dedicated to professionalizing the field, meaning that just because you're in recovery doesn't qualify you to work in the field, right? If, if, you're, if you need to do accounting and you're in recovery, but you're not an accountant, that's not probably a very good job for you. And so it's really been interesting for me in my own personal and professional and sort of value system. And as NATAP or NAATP tries to move the profession forward and professionalize it, that we figure out where lived experience and where professional training come together. And at the end of the day, common sense is correct. It takes a village, right? We should have all kinds of people. We need brain scientists who may or may not be in recovery. And we need people who understand what it's like to have suffered from this disease at the worst of it. And so I have a little of both. I was at a family wedding a couple of weeks ago and just chatting with people awkwardly as you do that you don't know, like, and you're trying to figure out something to say. And back in the day, I would have been looking forward to how can I get out of here to have a cigarette or a drink or something more powerful than that. But I was engaged, but frankly, not all that interested in the conversation. And this nice guy said to me, what do you do? And I told him I was, uh, what I did. And he said, oh, how did you get into that? Well, I said, well, my own personal recovery is how I got into that. I have other qualifications for the job, but it's my own recovery. And he kind of had a sense of that. And he said, I thought so. I kind of figured that you and I might have something in common. And he was a person in long-term recovery and off we went and, and we had a wonderful bonding which you do, right, in situations like that. So that's true. I work in this field largely because I am a person in long-term recovery. And the way I tell my story in briefest terms is there's two ways to become an alcoholic. One is you're born that way and you use. The other is you work really hard at it. And I'm of the work really hard at it variety, right? There is a certain reality, and we know this based on brain science, that those who have significant histories of family addiction themselves are more prone. If you've got both parents, yikes, the chances of you drinking successfully are pretty slight. And so, so often you hear, for example, in the 12-step rooms, I was a young person, maybe 13, 14 years old. I never felt like I belonged. I was pretty miserable. I took my first drink and all of a sudden I felt like I belonged, right? And I'm off to the races. Well, that wasn't me. I mean, I was a kid who was popular and a pretty good student. I was a jock. I was heading off to college. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer when I was a freshman in high school. I was successful, but we partied. The cool kids partied. You go out and you drink, and you know, during sports seasons, you try to get away with it or not do it. But so I always did that. I always was drinking and partying and mostly alcohol and a little weed in high school. And then college, you well, you know how college is. We had a lot of fun. And then law school is hard. And I remember in retrospect, this uh, lawyer coming in and during orientation and saying, folks, students, be careful. Some of us had a tendency to want to medicate our stress in law school with drugs and alcohol. It's not a good idea. That is not how you should do it. Please be careful. I've seen a lot of hurt come that way. And my attitude was like, well, you don't know me. I can do it. I can do both. Mm -hmm. And that's 
very much the attitude of a certain type of person who suffers from substance use disorder. We think we're better than, yeah, a normal person can't drink and get straight A's, but I can. And the, here's the thing of it. You can't for a while. And so I did for a long time. I should say I always drank to excess. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't always drink to excess, but I drank to excess. I drank to get drunk. I drank to party and used other substances, but I did great in law school and I was practicing law at a very, like 23, 24 years of age and became a very successful attorney young, but the pattern continued. So I began to, I would say, abuse substances worse and worse, but it wasn't until, I can't put an exact date on it. It wasn't until my late 30s or early 40s that a switch really got turned, and I then needed the substances. I couldn't not have them, and I was breaking. And so it took that long, but it happened. And at that moment, I had what the young person at 13 had, right? So however, it's a progressive disease, yeah. and, and for me, it just took a lot of use. I was running an organization. I was the CEO of an organization other than this one. And my board of directors took me aside, a number of people, after enough insanity and said, Marvin, it's over. You've got to get help mm -hmm. and we want you to get help. We love you. And so off to treatment I went and I haven't had a drink since. That was 15 years ago. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I have a similar progression. For me, it was age 48, two trips to rehab. First time I checked myself out against medical advice because I had it at two weeks and they laughed at me and said, we'll see you again. I was also terminally unique and it was progressive. Marvin, our business is care navigation, right? We are trying to facilitate and helping as many people as possible get access to the level of care that is appropriate for what they're suffering from. You were, I don't want to say privileged class, but you had resources that yeah. many people didn't. And now, right at NAATP, I would love to hear your thoughts on care navigation, right? You were in a particular situation where people loved you and cared for you. And they said, we're going to take them probably to a great place yep. where, right? So since you have become involved in the space, share your thoughts on care navigation, please. That's a big theme. It's really important. And you're right in the middle of it. Would love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you. That's insightful. I am a person of privilege. I'm a white upper middle class male in American society. That's about as good as it gets, right? Interestingly, I did realize, away from my addiction piece, that the American proposition was actually a very good and workable deal for me. That if I worked hard and I was smart and I tried hard and I did the right thing, I would be successful. You know what? It's a fair shake for people that look like me and come from where I came from. And I did get that. Uh, interestingly, I didn't apply it to what happened to me with drugs and alcohol, but I did get that, that I was privileged. What's interesting, though, is that I lost sight of that during early recovery. So I go to treatment. I'm miserable. I don't belong here. I'm better than everybody else. I don't know what I'm doing here. But somehow the magic did take place. It's not magic, but the therapeutic process worked really, really well for me. I should also say that it was built for me right? Traditional, if we will, 12-step Minnesota model treatment programs are built for middle-class white males. The social determinant of care that we get, it's not that it can't work for anybody else. Take my wife, who wouldn't mind me sharing this at all. She came through a, tra a traditional program like that. She works a program of Alcoholics Anonymous like I do, and it works for her. But she has to do a workaround. The language in the big book is patriarchal, and that we refuse to change that is is a shame, frankly. And so women do a workaround. But upper middle class white women probably, I would suggest, have an easier workaround than the BIPOC community, people from the BIPOC community who have very little commonality. So first of all, it's good that we recognize that access to care is determined in large part by your socioeconomic status. It just is. Frankly, how long you live or die in our society is determined by your socioeconomic status. But it's not just enough to say to people of color, for example, that we will help figure out how to get you into treatment because they end up in my treatment, right? The, 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 it has to be culturally competent care. And we have built very little culturally competent care in our country at this point. We're working on it. NATAP is working on it. 
but it's not just access, it's access to that which fits your turning point, an African-American treatment program for men in Minnesota, in the Minneapolis area, run by or founded by Dr. Peter Hayden, who's become a close colleague of mine and ours, <clears throat> is an example of our doing that for black men. And it's been very successful. But what happened was I got out of treatment and it was, you know, I understood that I, this was the beginning of a program and that I had to do it. And I got off the plane and I went to a meeting. I was a 7 a.m. York Street, Denver guy for two years without missing more than seven days a week, 7 a.m. I don't think I missed more than two meetings in two years. Now, eventually that that changed and that's not my current pattern. But I heard all these people just suffering in the room. And my view was, well, you must not be doing it right because this is the greatest time of my life. This is so much easier than what I was trying to pull off. And it was, right? Trying to be who I was and fake this and lead two lives and manage these substances and deal with the heinous pain of, of addiction and hold all those balls in the air was impossible. So early recovery was easy for me. And it was easy because... I shouldn't say easy. It was very manageable because I had all the recovery capital in the world. My board gave me a year's pay to go to meetings wow. and take naps. I would, I jokingly said, my life is getting up in the morning, going to meetings, working the steps, figuring out how I can help other people, and then taking a nap while Bonanza is on in the afternoon. And then I, and then getting up and feeling great and going for a walk with my dog. What are these people complaining about? But my God, how arrogant of me, because people were living on the streets and I can't even imagine what that was like. So navigating care is, there's so many levels to that. There are as close to 50 million people in this country that that meet the criteria for a substance use disorder. No kidding, 50 million. 10% get care, roughly, maybe 11 and why is that? It's a number of reasons, but one is that they don't seek it or want it. And we can't, and I don't mean that in a blaming way, but because of the way substance use disorder is viewed in our society, because of the little bit of information and understanding that there is, and because the disease is a disease that tells you don't have a disease, people don't seek or want treatment. So that's a big piece of it. And then finding it is is really difficult one of the primary detractors from getting care is insurance coverage mm -hmm. it's just it's lacking in many cases and when it does exist it's often not paid and companies violate parity law the mental health parity addiction and equity act has been in existence for over for two decades but it's uniformly disregarded by many insurers and congress hasn't done anything about it and the reason Congress hasn't done anything about it is because insurance lobby is a hell of a lot more powerful than the uh, addiction treatment lobby. <laughs> so there's all of that. I'll finish this piece and you can follow up if this has not been responsive by saying that NATAP has tried to help people find treatment by providing a place where good treatment providers can be found because we have criteria. There are about 10,000, maybe 15,000 treatment programs of some kind in the United States. And if you go to SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration locator, you'll see those, but they're not vetted in any mm -hmm. way. There's no disability in there. We've taken that and we have about, the association has, I'm not trying to make this a commercial for and NATEP, I'm really not. But what we have done is say, we have about a thousand locations around the country and our programs are vetted. You have to be licensed in all places for all services. You have to be accredited by a valid cr accrediting agency for all places. And then you have to be really, you have to follow our ethics code and our quality assurance manual. So that those are the kinds of things a consumer can look for when they're trying to find treatment. And we have a consumer guide to selecting treatment also on our website it, that, that's helpful to me. We're very familiar with that with our business, right? That we've got... Um similar goals of fighting this shared enemy and helping people get access to the right level of care. And Marvin, I'm not sure how much you're aware of your personal impact in the NAATP impact, but I'll share with you that our co-founders, Ben and Jeremiah, our business was founded in 2017. 
they have modeled the ethical standards that we have for our business after NAATP. They credit NAATP and you as the ones that turned around the space and cleaned it up. So that is wonderful. I don't know if you know that, but it was like, and I think Marvin, you had a little bit of a fix it job there. It, I, my background is in private business, Wall Street technology. There are turnaround guys or gals that are hired to come in and fix an underperforming entity, call it distressed assets, whatever it might be. So that's what we think you did at NAATP. And I would love to hear that story of were you recruited there? Uh, did they say this is the guy that can clean it up? What did you inherit? <laughs> and how did you do that? That, that? That's a story that needs to be told here. Oh, I appreciate the question, Cliff. Well, thank you for those kind words. I'm pleased that we've had a positive impact. It's our job to have a positive impact. So if we're successful to some extent, it's because we're doing what we need, what we should be doing. And thank you also for modeling the work that you all are doing on those principles. So yeah, gosh, where to begin? Okay, so my background is, as I said, an attorney and a teacher, but I also was an association director for a legal organization for 15 years that worked within the child and family welfare system. So attorneys and advocates helping children and families, and there's a great deal of addiction within that. But by virtue of my various roles, I have some acumen for association administration and management. And in its most basic sense, if you're a good association CEO and you have enough information about the product of that entity, whether it's lawyers, addiction, physicians, accountants, whatever it is, you should be able to do this, right? Now, I'm not saying that it's as simple as that or it's just switching one product for the next, but I did have a pretty good track record of doing this work and building an association that didn't have a great deal of depth to it when I got there. For example, the association I'm talking about was the National Association of, of Council for Children out of University Hospital in Denver, and we built the practice of law for children. It didn't exist and it became an ABA specialty. I wrote the textbook. We produced a test that allowed for it to become a specialty and the American Bar Association recognized that. Well, I saw the addiction treatment industry in much the same way in its infancy in many ways, needing structure, needing professionalism and needing guideposts in terms of two. I saw things and I still see things in two basic simple pots. One is values-based ethical behavior and operation, and the other is quality assurance standards. You get those two things and you've got a shot. And so that's what we did. And we started with ethics and we said, look, the vast majority of treatment providers that we see are wonderful. The NAATP uh, ones are wonderful. There are some we're seeing that aren't, and we know there's a lot of bad stuff out there. And the difficulty was in order to fix it, we had to expose it. And we got a lot of pushback on that. I had people saying, Marvin, why are you always talking crap about, that was the nice word, uh, about the field? And that's not what I was doing at all. I was saying, look, we're wonderful, but we've got to recognize where the poison is and get it out so that we can be successful. So we're going to look in our, at our, we're going to clean up our own house. And we're going to create an ethics code. And if you can't follow it and you don't fit it, you're out. And that was a big risk. I joked, I gave test. There was a period of time when I testified before Congress about this. And, and that was a real turning point for the association. People saw that. I said then, and, and I, I say now is executives of membership associations are judged by how well they grow the membership. And I was throwing people out. Whoops, you know, but the board supported that. <laughs> Because we thought, you know what, we need, if we need to get smaller to get better, we'll get smaller to get better. Ironically, the minute we took a public stand, and practically, I mean, the minute, was noticed and others wanted to join. And within a year of our removing, if you will, certain members and not having others renew or allowing others to renew, we grew significantly beyond where we started, right? And mm -hmm. so we made our footprint in ethics. Unfortunately, we were sued 
by a couple of entities, one of them a pretty powerful entity and big money, million dollar civil litigation is horrible as a lawyer having done it. I know that, but we didn't back off and we defended it for two years and prevailed. And in many ways, the most significant thing we did was simply doing the right thing and saying, we have some problems in this field, but by and large, we are amazing. Let's get rid of the, let's shine a bright light on the problem so that we can fix them and embrace it, embrace that we have some problems in our own house and move forward. And that's in a nutshell what happened. And it's been, and then that lot allowed us to go to the next piece of quality, right? Get your value systems in place and then move on to cr create quality standards, which didn't exist. That's the other thing that any field that is successful, but certainly professional fields have core competencies of competence. That's not an awkward way to say it, but there are these core competencies which provide proficient, I should say, treatment. And so we developed those in what we called our quality assurance manual, which by the way, second edition is coming out here in a couple of months. And it's a it's an improved product. And I think it gives a roadmap for how to produce good treatment. That's great. No, that's wonderful. You, I want to go back to a, something that you mentioned and have you expand on that a little bit more. You've talked about how we are spiritually unwell and we're divided and where you sit socially dictates what healthcare you will receive. You've also talked about movement from a social to a medical model. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and what initiatives are in place to help with that? Well, you must have read something that I wrote. Yeah, I, I think this is really important. Seriously, at the last conference, my address, I give a state of the industry address, so to speak, at the conference. And if we're to treat people for being unwell, we need to look at the context in which people exist. And the context in which we exist in our country is, in my estimation, and I think this is entirely defensible, spiritually unwell. I mean, physically unwell also, but we are an unwell and divided society. Healthy societies have shared value systems that allow the society to function as a community that relies on one another. We don't have that. We're broken into tribes. We're broken into at least two major tribes that almost seem to split about halfway down the middle. And then within that, there are factions and people become tribal in the sense that it's us against you. Mm -hmm. We're not feeling good about things. So we need somebody to blame. We need to find out who the bad guys are. You're the bad guys. We're the good guys. It's just a recipe for the decline of a society, frankly, but it certainly promotes addiction. Substance use disorder is a brain disease. It's a disease centered in the brain with biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations, right? It's a complex, multifaceted disease. It thrives on emotional unwellness. It thrives on dysfunction and it thrives on loneliness and separation. So COVID was the worst thing that could ever happen, right? In addition to the fact that we are ideologically divided in our country in terms of our value systems, we also have spent, COVID was just horrific in terms of separating us into loneliness and loneliness feeds addiction. Community heals addiction. So you take away community and you put people in lonely situations and we, you teach them how to hate and the disease is gonna flourish and it has, it's gone from somewhere around 30 million people prior to COVID to nearly 40 million people since COVID who meet the criteria. 800 people a day die. Uh, one of the illustrations that is powerful to me is Congresswoman Madeline Dean, Congresswoman from Pennsylvania. If, if you take alcohol out of the equation, alcohol, by the way, is the biggest killer, even though opiates and other drugs are more lethal and kill quicker. But if you take alcohol out of the equation, you got about 300 people who die a day. Well, that's about how many people are on an airplane. So she talks about how, imagine every day you got up, read the paper, and another plane crashed, killed all 300 people on board. Next morning, every day, another plane crashed, 300 people killed. Next day, another plane crashed, 300 people killed. You'd stop flying those planes. I mean, we would ground every damn plane. But it's worse that, than that with addiction. It's actually worse than th th those numbers. And so it's an astronomical problem and we face it within a culture that is unwell. 
And at that conference, I used the example of Elmo yeah. checking in on the Elmo check in, mm -hmm. which I'm serious, find very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And then I thought it was a good illustration. But Elmo, people, you know, Elmo's not real. I know that. But Elmo is, when you conjure up the image of Elmo, if you don't feel love and warmth and kindness and acceptance, there's something wrong. That is the lovable creature that has ever been created. And he doesn't judge. It almost brings tears to my eyes to think that this little caricature in its made human mm -hmm. wrote, a, wrote a, uh, a tweet one day that said, how is everybody doing? And it went viral and touched our hearts. Yeah. People wrote back, I'm not doing very well, Elmo. I'm not okay. I don't feel okay. And on and on and on again, 200 million views within a very short period of time. And so to me, that was a classic illustration of a couple of things. One, we're not well. And the other is we want to be loved and cared mm -hmm. for. How are you doing from an innocent little creature that has no agenda touched a, touched a string in our hearts? Well, Marvin, you, you, you don't sound like a rugged individualist being a <laughs> man from uh, Montana, which is interesting, right? Like the, this country, right? The rugged individualism. Yeah. And then if you look at the East and the West and the biological, social, psycho, I, I am an amateur psychologist. Uh, I'm not a clinician, but there's this book, Bowling Alone, right? The UK has a, a minister of, of loneliness. I love Jonathan Haidt. He's a moral psychologist and the righteous mind. He talks about autonomy, community, and divinity. And you just confirmed, like, we're really moving in the wrong direction. This country is an experiment. It's a very young country. Marvin, you're, you're the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers. How are we faring compared with the rest of the world and other cultures you know, for example, in Eastern cultures, there's more community and families live together for longer and they're more connected. And then we have the whole digital thing. Are we moving in the wrong direction faster than other cultures? I don't know if you have data on that, but it's fascinating. Well, it is fascinating. And I'm not qualified to answer whether we're moving in the, it, uh, faster. I would say, I mean, you can take my opinions for what they're worth, the listener can, but we're totally moving, uh, have been moving in the wrong direction. It's also very important, though, to look at the bright spots. I mean, there are amazing people doing amazing things every day. There are people who see somebody in trouble and they pull over and they help one another. So I'm a kid who grew up in the 60s in Billings, Montana. My dad ran the Firestone store. He was an Italian Catholic from Brooklyn, New York, who grew up without a dad in the Depression. He was nine years old when the Depression started. He was 18 years old when he left Brooklyn for the first time to fight World War II. He is the greatest generation. And he was poor. He met my mom during the war. She was a farm girl from Greeley, Colorado. After the war, they went to New York. It didn't work out. My mom, I think, just couldn't take it. So they end up with her farming family in Billings, Montana. Well, Billings had about 100,000 people. So it was like growing up in the suburbs. I always say I'm like the Wonder Years kid. That was kind of my life. There was an older boy up the street who died in Vietnam. But, uh, you know, I didn't really know him. But my childhood was, was very good. But my dad said a couple of things over the years. He said to my sister one day, who was being arrogant, she tells this story, she's a college professor, that she was clearly judging some people that were nearby as, as being, I don't know, unintelligent or unsophisticated or something. And my dad saw that. He had made a successful life for our family, but he never forgot where he came from. And her name is Teresa. And he said, Teresa, he still had his Brooklyn accent. It takes all kinds of people to make a world. And that never left her and it's never left me. Now, at the same time, at one point when I was becoming a young man, I had my arguments with my dad. By the way, my dad passed away this last Christmas at 102. He was 102 years wow. old and he was going strong until 101 and a half. I mean, he was quite something. Yeah. He was a man of his generation. We weren't real huggy, but uh, he was there for us. And at one point he said, son, I'm proud of you because you have become an individual. Mm. But he didn't mean that I existed as an individual separate from others. He meant that I had found a way to be myself, mm -hmm. that I was me, and that, that everybody needs to find their voice. 
and then contribute that voice. So individualism and community can go together if we have the right sense of balance. So I'm an outdoors person and I am 10 days away from my next fly fishing trip in the Colorado wilderness. After a staff meeting in Denver, I'm going to go where I cannot be found and cell phones don't work and fly. I'm a bit avid fly fisher. Take and, me with you, please. Yeah, right. <laughs> I live in the DC area now. It's a long ways from Billings, Montana or, or Missoula, Montana, where I went to law school, which is a river runs through it territory and all of that. That's a spiritual endeavor, by the way, fly fishing. There's a treatment center in Tennessee that has a, a young men's program. It, it's building a young women's program now as well, thankfully. But they have a fly fishing component because it teaches patience, detail, focus, and presence. When you're in a river and you're present and you're doing this thing in unison with the river, right? You have to be able to be part of. You don't fight the fish. You work with the fish. There's really, it's really quite amazing. There's also some research that shows it helps with PTSD. Yeah. But yeah, now, Marvin, I, I did the uh, Roaring Fork near Carbondale with the Jaywalkers oh. event last year. So I'm tracking you 100%. So. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Those are great folks up there. And that's beautiful country on the western side of the state. Absolutely. So Montana has always been a very interesting political place because although it is rugged individualism, it's, and it's, it would tend to be a conservative ideology, it's never really followed the rules of being a, a blue state or a red state. It's hard to predict. And I see Montanans as people who feel the need to be self-reliant and then help your neighbor when for some reason your neighbor needs mm -hmm. you. I mean, it's not complicated. These are Judeo-Christian traditions that we were all brought up with, but we've moved away from that. And look, if you study history, you can see through the history of civilizations, paid sections of nationalism. If you take a look at what happened to Germany between World War I and then the rise of the Third Reich, it was a suffering society that a horrible human found the opportunity to create hate as a mechanism of control. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that that's precisely what's happening here. And I'm not qualified to suggest that, but the parallels are there. Our other countries. It, okay. So here's sometimes I think, well, this process that's happening in the United States is interesting, but it's happening worldwide. And certainly in the Western world that it's happening. Now, if you do health studies of people's life satisfaction, you do find countries that are doing far better than others. The Northern European countries seem to have very high health and happiness standards. Norway, Denmark, Sweden, places like that. I read about that. I don't know any more about that, though, than what I read in the paper. You're making things so much better. You're doing such great work. So let's shift to what we can get excited about. And there's a lot. So... I love the work that I believe, Marvin, your organization did. Did you create FORCE? In the, is that the right way to, to say it? Yeah, so FORCE, F-O-R-S-E, is the acronym for the Foundation for Recovery Science and Education. So yes, well, I didn't, we did. So, it, so the National Association has known for some time that we needed to get a better handle on outcomes data. In order for addiction treatment to take its rightful place in healthcare, we need the numbers, right? We need to study this and we need to follow the science. By no means does following the science mean we move away from spiritual traditions. Those are scientific pieces too. But this is a disease centered in the brain it's complicated. We need to understand all of its ramifications. And the way you learn that in science and in medicine is to study patients before, during, and after. And you look for wellness measures and try to replicate those. And so we did a pilot study to see if we could do a project like this in 2000. Well, I started it almost as soon as I got in the seat here. And I started on May 1st, 2015, and we had an outcomes program running, a pilot program by the end of that calendar year, and it's called the Outcomes Pilot Program. Wow. And it proved the concept that we could take data from multiple treatment programs mm -hmm. and bring them in and analyze them and, and, and have some indication of what's happening to patients. You have to do that. And so that led to ultimately the founding of FORCE 
in. <laughs> My timing was impeccable. I received authorization from our board of directors on March 12th of 2020 to launch the program oh. and COVID the broke. day before COVID, right? Yeah. A week later. Okay. I remember getting on the, it was a meeting in San Diego and I remember getting on the airplane or go, going to the San Diego airport to come back to Denver. And all, I saw all these people wearing masks and I was like, what the hell is, what's going on with all these masks? And then it hit, but we launched it and we had to, early on, I had to decide, you know, are we going to postpone this? Or are we going to try to push through? And we decided to push through and we hired Dr. Annie Peters. She's the director. She's fabulous. And she has uh, done just amazing work and it didn't exist except in our minds. We called it our moonshot in March of 2020. And now we have 200 treatment centers sending in data daily and half a, approximately half a million unique patient episodes to study. And we've we uh, published our second annual report just last month, and it's available for anybody who wants to see it online, FORCE 2024 annual report. And treatment programs that participate in it get their own data, private data. That's just, the report is the aggregate of the whole, but individual programs who participate get individual reports so that they can see what's happening real time with their patients. And we talk about that as measurement-based practice. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying it's not working for Marvin, we can say, here's what, here's who it's, here's what's happening with Marvin. Here's his sleep. Here's his, you know, mood disorder uh, and all of these things. And then we can understand why that's happening, make adjustments as we move along through care. Yeah, so something that seems to have come up in almost all of the threads we've woven thus far is, for me, stigma. So we have the same goal. We want to help more people find treatment. And we have the same enemy, which is, I think, one of the leading factors, keeping people from being ready for treatment or seeking treatment, and that's stigma. And I'm just curious to hear if anything NATAP is doing to combat stigma. Yeah, it's a huge piece. I'm sometimes asked if it's better than it used to be, if the stigma keeping people away from treatment or just making people who suffer from substance use disorder rather than ill, somehow something wrong with them or morally inadequate. So stigma still exists in a massive way in all mental health, behavioral health care and substance use disorder. But I would say that we've made considerable progress. People are public people like me, but all kinds of people who are quite powerful and important and, and known in society, certainly lots of celebrities. People like Rob Lowe do a wonderful job of talking about this. And so it's acceptable to a degree that it hasn't been before and it's understood. It's not, I mean, people I think have trouble recognizing that it's a disease that's complicated, but if you can see it in a brain scan, folks, it's a disease. And so I think that we've really made good progress, but we have to continue. I think about putting it all within the umbrella of behavioral health is a questionable term now because it suggests behavior, but without putting blame, addiction causes certain behaviors, even illegal behaviors, drug seeking behaviors. And so it is a behavioral health disorder. And I think that we just need to continue the education process. So it's really important to talk about this. We have to continue to make progress and it's an educational component largely, but the more people that come forward and talk about this and the more scientists who come forward and talk about this as a medical disease, which it is, the, the better. But no doubt, it's a huge reason why people don't seek treatment and others are blamed for it. One of the things we need to do is change our language. And I've used the word addiction and maybe addict several times in this podcast, but addict, I mean, how kind does that word say? He's an addict. Um, and alcoholic too. Or alcoholic. I identify as an alcoholic, but man, those words, the first meeting when you have to really say like, and it comes yeah. your turn in a 12 step meeting, right? Like I, I do not live under a bridge with a brown bag. I think there was a lot of shame, you know, in 1935, 1936, 1937, you know, the, the second A of that program that we use doesn't help us either, no. right? Our secrets keep us sick, but 
1939, if I raised my hand and said, hi, I'm an alcoholic. Well, guess what, Cliff? You're not getting a job. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. So it, that, that, that's hard. And I love the program. I'm a 12 step guy, but with you, Marvin, like I do think that institutions need to be dynamic and, and what worked and, and I am not one to question AA. They've saved millions of lives, but I really do think like as much as it is public in Hollywood, yes. Celebrities. Can anyone name a fortune 500 CEO who's in recovery? Well, I can, but I, I'm oh, not surprised to tell you who it is. Yeah, yeah, well, you can't publicly, right? Yeah. Right. I don't mean to make light of it. You're exactly right. I mean, so we have a new term that has really taken root professionally. When we stand up, we say, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really good. Yeah. And so that's certainly one way to say it. But you're right. In 12-step rooms, we say, my name is Marv and I'm an alcoholic. And I comply with that because I... It's not my rules. I didn't decide them. And Alcoholics Anonymous principles, as imperfect as the execution of some of the program may be, saved my life and continue to do so. I'd like to see some improvements and changes. Look, we know, I think Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, would be carrying the flag for modifications to the big book and program advancements. Not throwing out that which works. I mean, there's nobody, you're not trying to do that, but there's definitely a blame piece that's part of this. It comes out of Christian tradition and the Oxford groups of the 1930s, where the system that the 12 steps come from was based on a Christian belief that if you admitted your the error of your ways, being an alcoholic, and committed yourself to God, and made amends and worked to clean up the harm you've caused that you could recover and with the help of God as the intervening force. And it was very powerful and it worked. And ultimately the founders of AA used much of that moving forward. I would say it was a massive advancement on the Oxford groups because Bill Wilson used the word God of your understanding, he right. used yeah. the word higher power. And so that helps a lot. But I will say that as wonderful as as 12 step work is, and it is, and it should, those print, you know, John Kelly, the Harvard researcher, has demonstrated unequivocally that 12 step facilitation works mm-hmm. and works for everybody, but it has real value. It's not just a social program, it is a social program, but it's a social program that works and it's based on good principles. But it does at its core say, you turn yourself over to a higher power who intervenes and runs the show. And I'm not here to say whether that's true or not. I will say that it's not the way I think about it. As a person in, in long-term recovery, I don't, my God conception, we don't talk about this very much. It's almost taboo to talk about it, but God, as I understand him, and there's the patriarchal pronoun, different than that. So my, for myself, I was like, Hey, I want to live healthily. I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to view it this way. When somebody talks about their vision of God, that is in conflict with mine. I just, that's not my deal. They get to do their deal and I get to do mine. But I do think that that keeps people away. Mm -hmm. There is a large segment of society that, that don't identify with that. And there need to be multiple pathways. Yeah. And it, yeah. It's not what we talk about. It. Yeah, we are seeing that, right? With I think there's the growth in, you know, peer support services and recovery coaches and the multiple pathways. I think all of that is exciting. And yeah, I, I like to study the history too and the slaying the dragon and the history of where we came from. Today is the best time ever to have what we have, no doubt about it. And it's moving in the right direction. I think the absolute right? The Oxford group, honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. There's no absolute possible, right? And we aim for progress rather than perfection. I agree. I think Bill Wilson, he promoted being open-minded, willingness, and honesty. Uh, Marvin, you talked about changing terms and and changing things and changing perception. Rebranding matters a lot of times because the only constant is change. It hit me hard at NAATP, you talked about overdose deaths, and then you corrected yourself. And you said, we're not going to talk about overdoses, we're going to talk about poisonings. That's big. It's really big. Alcohol is poison. 
the alcoholic death, if it's not an accident or something, a suicide, it's just a 20 year death. My dad died at 55 and I watched him deteriorate. I was on a similar path, different with heroin, fentanyl in the East. So explain that poisoning versus overdose. And I don't know how advanced that is, but it's very <laughs> compelling and, and intriguing. Well, th yeah, thanks for bringing it up. I mean that, uh, Cliff, thanks for bringing it up. But it also makes me a little nervous because I'm on thin ice on this one, but I'll continue to skate along. I think that it cuts both ways talking about it that way, because here's where it doesn't help. My framing of it that way doesn't help when we talk about harm reduction so much, right? So if harm reduction is about managing use to create less suffering, and that's what it is, and that's good, and it needs to be, we're saying it's okay to use a certain amount of poison, or it gets a little tricky talking about it that way. But on the other side of the coin, it's like that, talk about pejorative terms, he died of an overdose. Well, he's a junkie, he's an addict, yeah, that's a way to say it, but what actually medically happened, he was poisoned. He died of poisoning. I'm not making that up. That's true. That stuff is poison. Fentanyl is poison. The person took it and it killed him. He was poisoned to death. And so I think that there's value in, in recognizing that without then saying that anybody who continues to use any substance is not entitled to do so. That harm reduction, you can't treat dead right? That's the thing we say. It sounds awful to talk about it like that, but you can't treat dead. But at the same time, we hope that the uh, recovery means a full recovery into a life of complete, meaningful human potential, which you're not going to have under certain levels of use. But we have to let people choose their pathway and their timeline, and we don't know what that is. So I chose to talk about it that way intentionally. You, if you're recalling the slide, I had actually written the word overdose and crossed it out and wrote poisoning because I just wanted folks to think about it for a minute that way. And to the extent that I'm on thin ice and it's not the best way to talk about it, that's okay. Let's try talking about it different ways and see if we can get there. And if some of the ways that I try to talk about it prove to be unwise, I'm trying. I guess. I, 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 Marvin, I, I commend you. We, we need to challenge institutions and we need to, to be open-minded. And I was 13 years old and I was a blackout drinker immediately. I was poisoned with a jungle juice concoction of things we all stole from our parents. The normal people stopped after drinking Midori and peppermint schnapps and Kahlua mixed together. For some reason, I didn't. Right. And I was poisoned and I was passed out for three hours. The other kids weren't. So I, it hit me hard, man. I agree. And I have to own right my disease and my recovery and anything and everything that comes with that. But I absolutely felt like, yes, and, and the world convinced me that consuming alcohol would be good for me. It wasn't. It didn't help me at all. And I had a 35 year run. It was so culturally ingrained mm -hmm. into every element of working class Irish Catholic, right? Like uh, where I went to school, yeah, Dartmouth yeah. College, tremendous alcoholism, Wisconsin, tremendous alcoholism, right? Like yeah. in, in the yeah. first time I saw a therapist when I was 48 years old, she said, how the heck did you last so long? You're a ticking right. time bomb. And I agree with you that alcohol right? It is the one that's killing more people than anyone else. And that's with bad data too. Yeah, that's pretty clear from the data. Yeah, it's interesting. Our lives of use are so mixed. One of the things I do like to talk about that's kind of related to that is accuracy. We don't want to glorify our use. Mm -hmm. Neither do we want to paint it as something that it wasn't. Here's one of my most frustrating things that I hear my worst day sober was better than my best day drunk. Mm -hmm. Nonsense. My response to that is you're doing it wrong because I had a blast. <laughs> now, I don't want to go into a teenage classroom and say, hey, you guys, I had a great time, you know, doing blow. And but I did for a while. Right. And so what's the point of all of this? Get everything right sized. 
if there was a period of, of ecstatic fun and pleasure, then that's what it was. Now, if I hadn't stopped that, I wouldn't be speaking to you mm -hmm. here. I would be dead. Didn't stay that way. It became, as the big book says, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization right mm -hmm. that's a term from from the alcoholics anonymous text so we have to talk about it correctly and i bet you know even as a teenage kid you had a blast some of that time that's the thing of it if a substance is harmful to certain population the more of it that's there the more harm it will cause so the legalization of marijuana is a really interesting one because i've been in my life pretty progressive about marijuana thinking about first of all being classified as a schedule one narcotic is nonsense it's not a schedule one narcotic it never should have been that's a political designation and so now there is an attempt of it's probably going to happen to reclassify it at the same time it's incredibly harmful to many people and at its core marijuana is is a hallucinogen mm -hmm. and, and at the thc levels that it can be made available now it's incredibly yeah. helpful. And so, you know, we're seeing so many young people right now in treatment that are seriously damaged from, from marijuana yeah. use and its powerful components. It's not the ditch weed cliff that you and I smoked growing up. That's no, it's sure. not Brown town. It's 18, 22% yeah. THC yeah. as compared with 3%. Mm -hmm. And yeah, adolescent cannabis use disorder is one of the fastest growing treatment yeah. programs. Psychosis, mm -hmm. cannabis-induced yeah. psychosis. Just the talking a little bit about harm reduction and MAT got me thinking about the thousand centers or the thousand treatment programs that have been vetted by NATAP and what that landscape looks like in terms of the continuum of care. Do you have MAT centers as members? Do you have a lot of outpatient? Are you exploring in different? I'll let you speak to it. Yeah, great question, really, because if we're a microcosm of what's happening, and I think we sort of are, then that matters. Well, once upon a time, not that many years ago, certainly a couple of decades, NATAP would have been almost entirely small residential programs. We called them Minnesota model programs. They came from the Hazelden model, more or less, and they maybe had anywhere from 20 to 150 beds, and they were freestanding businesses, and there was a one-size-fits-all method, 28 days, the whole concept of 28 days. By the way, I don't know that this is apropos of anything, but Sandra Bullock's movie, 28 Days, is really fabulous. I wish young people would watch it because she's a classic example of a party girl. Jessica, my wife, always says, yep, that was me, and who then, you know, it got bad. And she went to treatment, and it, it works for her in the movie. That was the model. Well, it's not the model for everybody. What we need to have gotten to, and we're getting there, based on the scientific movement of this as a medical disorder and a healthcare matter, is evaluation assessment that puts you where you need to be. People in this country, men get prostate cancer. Prostate cancer can range from a tiny little cancerous tumor that will never cause any problem to a tumor that will kill you tomorrow. So you need to be able to assess that and provide the course of treatment that is appropriate to that. To do intervention surgery and remove the prostate of someone whose cancer will never cause any harm is would be malpractice, right? So we need to take the same approach with addiction treatment. We need assessment tools that are good enough to determine what you need. And some people will need residential care. That's what physicians do. It would be nice if we had a blood pressure cuff. The greatest healthcare instrument arguably ever created is a blood pressure cuff. That's the first thing they put on you. And it tells the physician a lot and, and so many different interventions from heart surgery to taking a, I can't remember what you call it, a statin mm -hmm. is what's prescribed. So the same thing needs to happen with addiction treatment. Most people with a mild substance use disorder can figure out how to get well on their own. That's shocking, but most people that drink a little too much beer can stop drinking a little too much beer. That's a substance use disorder. It's causing a problem in their lives and they turn to it to be okay. Mm -hmm. But with family assistance, maybe some counseling, that person can probably get well. And many, many people do. That's a segment on one, it's not tiny, actually, it's a large segment, but it's one segment. 
along the continuum there all the way to residential, you know, some people, if they're not detoxed professionally today are going to die. So that medical detox has to happen based on an accurate assessment. IOP, intensive outpatient, has become the primary treatment methodology, and that's probably correct. And so some people go to residential treatment and then IOP. Some people do an IOP, do well at it, and that's that. Some people do an IOP, and it's determined later that maybe they need residential care. Medication-assisted treatment. How dare you ask me about medication-assisted treatment? I'm just kidding. But in 2015, maybe it was 16, but so I haven't been there very long. I wrote an article for the membership that said we have to embrace Matt. And I've never gotten so much hate mail as I got on that day. I don't get that hate mail anymore. That's nonsense. That ship has sailed. The train has left the station and Matt is here to stay. It's almost a dumb term, medication-assisted treatment. Well, that's like saying, okay, you have diabetes. Do you do medication-assisted treatment? Well, yeah, I eat well and I take my medicine. That's all it is. Now it's complex and it depends on the level of disease, but Matt, we has to be part of this. So yes, we do have members along the entire continuum, primarily outpatient methadone clinics. We have a couple. And I think that there are some folks who wonder whether that's the right thing for this association to do, but it is, we got to help everybody. And a good way that I think about it, even though this isn't necessarily the only way to think about it, is let's meet people where we find them, but not leave them mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. I think is a good way to say that. And I stole that from Regina LaBelle from Georgetown. And that doesn't mean meet people where they are and then force them to the outcome that we want. That's the whole notion of motivational interviewing, yeah. which is the foundation of psychological therapy is meet somebody where they are and help them discover their situation through motivational interviewing. You take the client where you find the client. If a therapist doesn't accept that, then that therapist isn't doing their job right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amanda, did you have anything else? No, I just really enjoyed that. Thank you. As a woman who has gone through almost all of the different permutations of care, and I still take ant abuse, even though I'm almost five years sober, I just respect all the different pathways so much. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah I was given, I never took ant abuse, but I was given camperol mm -hmm. early like by my psychologist, where a psychiatrist when I was first trying to get sober. Mm -hmm. I I was drinking by the time I got back yeah, in the car. Yeah. It is a evidence-based medication and works for some, helps for some with some people. I call it like my seventh or eighth safety net. <laughs> it's you know? good to have as many recovery capital. The more recovery capital you have, the better you'll yeah. do. So, and, and I had a, I was privileged to have a lot, and I wish that we could give a lot to everybody. I think that's what we have to work yeah. toward. Yeah, I just have one one last point here. And Dr. Molly, I know we're running short on time, but I went to residential treatment twice. I had a 35 year run. So that is roughly 420 months of alcohol consumption. I think the longest I probably ever went was a week, maybe without a drink. And I thought a month was a long time, right? Like what, you want me to go away for a month? And it didn't work. It worked the second time for me. And Marvin, as you know, there's people that go six times, eight times, 12 times. You see a lot of pressure against residential. And I think the only strong correlation is length of time in treatment. If you go 60 days, 90 days, like Jay Walker Lodge, a burning tree in Texas has extended care programs. Marvin, do you think we're ever gonna see the insurance community say, yes, this needs to happen and you have to go live somewhere and be in this fellowship and community because it almost seems like we have pressure against that when that's the only thing that we know works. That's not what I see anyway. No, you're right. The data, the science is clear that treatment works and more treatment works better. And the correlation between recovery and length of time and care is clear. Whether it's a 12-step room or something else, that recovery capital is what keeps people on the pathway to recovery. So do I think that we will get to the place where insurers will recognize that this is the best path to wellness and provide it? No, because we can't make the economic case that makes them rich. Mm -hmm. And I wish I weren't saying that so profoundly, 
And look, we work with insurers. We're going to meet with some of the top executives from the main, the major payers here this fall. And we have to partner and work together. And there's a lot of good folks trying to do the right things. But look, stop it. Stop pretending that it is not the insurance company's job to make money. That's why they're in business to make money. And the less money the pay, they pay out, the more money we make. Managed care. I talked about this at the conference. Our healthcare system is built on the notion of managed care, and it's not going to change in any universe that I can imagine. And managed care means that the scientist doesn't decide what health care you get. The accountant decides what health care you get. That's what managed care is. And we force their hand as much as we can. Now, an economic case can be made for insurers to provide care to a point, and they definitely do. The major carriers right now have wellness check programs. So if we can, to the extent that we can make the economic case for their profitability and show wellness, then the answer is yes. But ultimately, a managed care system is not going to produce the ideal, is I guess how I would say it. Just an observation. I love your definition of managed care. I've ne never heard it that way. It's accurate. Sure. My partner works in peer support and Medicaid covers peer support services, but there's no movement for big insurance companies to cover peer support services, even though it's the cheapest yeah. option. You would think they'd be chomping at the bit to maybe pay a little bit and make this thing go away as opposed to a 30 to 60 day stay at a big fancy place. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> It depends on how you run the numbers. It depends on where the cash flow analysis occurs. It, and so it, it's a really complicated Harvard Business School uh, proposition to figure that out exactly. But it's not as simple as over the life of this human being, we will save money if we give them the proper care. If that were the analysis, then we'd largely get there. But even then, there's an actuarial analysis that the accountants at the insurance company can provide that indicate that guy's going to die before then anyway, so it doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense. So, but the analysis is not as simple as that. There is a question of how much money we need to make this year for our stockholders. Mm -hmm. In this tricky time of balancing recession, where do we need to be in 12 months to survive the next 12? It's just more complicated. Yeah. But I should say that the, the insurers do have an interest and they do recognize an interest in providing a level of, of good health care. If I sound like I'm painting them as the devil, I'm wrong to do that. It's not that, but they are a business designed to make right. money. Well, we know that people who get treatment get better and that the numbers are still high. There's a lot of people who aren't getting treatment. For a variety of reasons that we've talked about today, stigma, lack of access, lack of coverage, uncertainty, being courageous enough to be part of a community and take themselves out of isolation. With the ongoing changes and challenges in healthcare, where do you see this field going in the next decade? Well, mostly I see us making good progress toward providing better care. I really, really do but it's going to look different. There's this funny trade-off, right? For the longest time, we thought we're, we're healthcare. Recognize us as healthcare. This is a disease and it's a, and then the solution is a healthcare solution. So what we need is clear indication from the scientific community that it's a disease. And then we need payment mechanisms put in place to treat that. Well, both of those things happened. There's no scientific argument that this is not a disease. Stop that already. If you're out, who's ever out there saying that that's nonsense. But the second piece of that, that there's a payment source is where it gets more interesting. So parity law is passed, which says if you cover, not that you must, but if you cover substance use disorder within the plan, then you have to pay grant claims based on the same kind of criteria that you would for any other, what's called medical or surgical. Well, that's huge, right? We've got parity. And then Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act comes along and says, makes it even better by saying substance use disorder and mental health have to be one of the 10 essential health care benefits contained in policies that are traded on the exchange. So now we've got a disease, parity law, and 
a huge amount of insurance that's now going to have to cover it. And so we should be looking pretty good about now, but it hasn't happened to the degree that it should have, partly because the policies aren't sufficient that people acquire, and also because claims are still denied at a disproportional rate compared to medical and surgical. But that process has to happen. We're very afraid in our country of using terms that suggest there's anything like nationalized or socialized systems. Yeah. But there are, not the least of which is Social Security, which has been around for a very long time. So we can develop, we, we're not going to have a single payer nationalized healthcare system. We're not. So within the current managed care system, what can we do to move it in those, those equitable directions? And I think that there are lots of things that we can do. So I think the system will continue to make incremental progress depending on who's in power and what, how the political current flows. But moreover, what's happening is treatment is becoming more healthcare institution and physician based. So though all those Minnesota model freestanding residential treatment programs, they're disappearing. Some of them are going out of business because it's too hard to compete. Same as the local bookstore and Barnes and Noble, right? I kind of like Barnes and Noble, but I like the local bookstore better. The larger behavioral health companies are, are buying, are acquiring the smaller companies. So if you look at our, even our membership, where at one time we were mostly a bunch of those little ones. Now we've got a lot of big guys owning what used to be the, the little ones. And that's just field consolidation. And that's an economic reality within this kind of a system. Same thing happens in other areas of healthcare. Same things happened in nursing homes. Big companies are taking over little companies. And so the trend will be larger companies providing care in lots of different places and, and hospital-based and physician care. Mm -hmm. It's not all bad. It's not all right. good. It's just what it is. Thank you so much for that. Anybody else have any other questions before we land on our last question? I learned so much from Marvin yeah. and I think he's who I want to be when I grow <laughs> up. So I could spend a lot of time with him, but I know we've got a limited amount of time and I'm, just would like to express my gratitude, Marvin, truly for everything you've done for all of us and for giving us today some of your time and insight. This is wonderful. So that's all I have. Well, ditto what Cliff said, but I'd like to add how refreshing it was for me, your authenticity mm -hmm. and no bullshit is a fan favorite for me. It's my favorite way of being in this world. So that was a, a nice bonus surprise. <laughs> well, the last question that we ask everyone is, what does recovery mean to you? Wow, that's a big finish, isn't it? I think about this a lot. Recovery to me means that I am a healthy worker among workers. It means I'm a person that is happy and healthy, loved, and loving in a large community of human beings and that I don't uh, exist separately from any piece of the universe, whether it's a fish or another person, it's, we're all part of this whole. And when you're in your disease, it is the complete opposite. You're all by yourself and it's a very lonely place. So to me, it's about belonging. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Marvin, thank you for your time. We are so appreciative of it. And I definitely foresee you coming back in the future. There's so much to talk about and so much to also follow with the wonderful work that you're doing with NATAP. So thank you. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It was fun. <laughs>